Amen. Amen. Let's let's read together Psalm 63. I, I'm actually going to read this morning uh, from uh, the King James. It, it won't be on the screen, so follow along in your translation or or do as we do on Wednesday nights and just listen. Just listen and hear uh, and hear the reading. Amen. Amen. Psalm 63 verses 1 through 8. O oh God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee, my flesh longeth for thee. In a dry and thirsty land where no water is, to see thy power and thy glory, so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. Because thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee. Thus will I bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness. My mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. When I remember thee upon my bed and meditate on thee in the night watches, because thou hast been my help. Therefore, in the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. My soul followeth hard after thee. Thy right hand upholdeth me. A couple of weeks ago, I, I got to chaperone my four year old grandson's. Uh, class field trip. Yeah. Field trip to museum of uh, the natural museum, I think it's called. The beauty, beauty of, of God's creation on display was a reminder of the greatness and the goodness of our glorious God. Just a few animals, nothing, nothing like the zoo, but, but enough of the animals and insects to remind us of our creativity of our great God. I, I, was, uh, I, I, was just, uh, I was just taken aback by some of the things that I was able to see, the monarchs in, in, in full array just uh just a beautiful time the the, the kids the, the four-year-olds uh they were they were not uh so philosophical as me uh, uh, they just they just had fun uh touching uh touching worms and uh and and touching uh little uh beetles they called roly polies you touch them and they roll up in a in a in a little ball uh giant cockroaches and and spiders and dodging the the gorgeous uh, hundreds of monarch butterflies, uh, there there were also uh, small live creatures uh, in in glass enclosed uh, replicas of their natural habitat. Uh, beautiful furry uh, creatures. There was plenty of <coughs> uh, posted information about the animals, but the four-year-olds can't read. They, they, just, they just wanted to see the animals and, and touch them and draw back as though they were afraid. They, they just wanted to see the furry creatures, all the children, all the children, young, young and old, uh, from four to 65, strained to catch a peek at the small white furry creatures behind the glass they, that, that set things up so situated so that, uh, that, that the food and the water and the way that things were set up uh, was, was in such a way that it would draw the, the, the small creatures out of hiding so that, so that the guests uh, might get a look, catch a glimpse of the beauty of these small furry creatures. 
What about the noise of a busload of four-year-olds calling out to them and tapping on the glass was far too much for these shy creatures. And so they hid in the dark corners and under the rocks and the brush that had been created for them. In, in his book, A Hidden Wholeness, A Journey Towards an Undivided Life, Parker J. Palmer describes the soul this way. He says, the soul is like a wild animal, tough, resilient, savvy, self-sufficient, yet exceedingly shy. If you want to see a wild animal, the last thing that we should do is to go crashing through the woods, shouting for the creature to come out. But if we are willing to walk quietly into the woods and sit silently for an hour or two at the base of a tree, the creature we are waiting to see may well emerge. And out of the corner of an eye, we will catch a glimpse of the precious wildness that we see. When David journals about his wilderness experience, about his soul thirsting for God in the wilderness, hungry for the presence of God, he uses a Hebrew word, nepish, for the word soul. Nepish is a breathing creature. It is a wild animal. Psalm 42, David describes his soul as a deer, as a deer in the wild, desperate for water that he cannot live without. The soul is like a deer. It is nepish. It is tough, resilient, savvy, self-sufficient, yet shy. The soul, the soul the soul is drawn to water, yet the soul is easily frightened. It will retreat into hiding if it at all feels unsafe. The soul doesn't feel safe. The soul will retreat into the brush of pretense and pride. If the soul feels unsafe, it will barricade itself behind busyness and preoccupation. If the soul doesn't feel safe, it will, it will hide itself beside, behind diversions and, and distractions. The soul will hide in self-protection and convince itself that its nakedness is far too vulnerable in the open. It will hide behind fig leaves of religion, self-help, and churchiness. Choosing rather uh, to look like one who drinks rather than actually risk drinking. Because drinking requires exposure. And exposure is risky. It feels risky to the nepish. We, you and I, want our souls to experience the nearness of God we must create space for our hungry and thirsty soul to come out of hiding and expose itself to God. Remember, we've, we've said this before in many different ways. Remember that, that transformation, transformation, are you still here with me? There you go. Transformation is not about what we draw out of the text, but rather what the text draws out of us. Hungry soul. And so I wanna, I wanna highlight three phrases and I, I'll be done shortly. Three phrases in Psalm 63 from David's journal that invite the soul out of hiding. 
invites our souls, woos and coaxes our souls out of hiding to the still cool waters and the open range that we might drink and eat, be refreshed and live. I want to talk about those three phrases. We talk about uh, our, continue our journey uh, towards renewal and revival, and having our souls refreshed. Here are those three first ver uh, phrases. They show up in verse number one, uh, verse number five, and verse number eight. In verse number one, David says, my soul thirst. In verse five, he says, my soul is satisfied. And in verse number eight, he says, my soul follows hard after you. And so he lays, as it were, as it were for us, uh, David, David, David uses this phrase in, uh, in Psalm 23. He says, he talks about, he says, the, the, the good shepherd, the shepherd leads him beside the still waters. I, I, I've read that phrase many times, and I always thought that he leads me beside the still waters. I've always read it to say he leads me to still waters, but, but that's not what David says. He says he leads me beside the still waters. He lays, as it were, for me breadcrumbs along the way to lead me to a, sla a safe place to graze and to drink. If you and I want to have our souls renewed and revived we have to be willing to to bring it out of hiding to coax it to draw it out of hiding so that our soul can be exposed to God and he can he can renew and transform us as long as we hide our souls he cannot make them whole and so David uh, says in verse 1, uh, as we peek into his journal and he draws us, draws out from us the soul that we're hiding from God and yet want him to revive. David says in verse 1, the soul that thirsts for God seeks God. The soul that thirsts for God seeks God. Psalmist describes himself here as a thirsty man in a dry and a weary place. Not only is he thirsty, but the ground is thirsty. He is a thirsty man in a dry and weary place, and he says, where no water is. So, so is the will, it's the heart, it's the mind. Of a man, it is the reasoning, it is the emotions, it is the desires, and often the will and the mind and the reasoning and the emotions and the desires, all of those rolled up make up the soul. Very often they're in conflict and at war with each other. Anybody know what I'm talking about? To have your mind and your heart be at war, to have your mind know it ain't right, but your soul, your heart wants it. To have your soul want something that your mind knows doesn't make sense. To have, have your heart chasing somebody that your mind knows ain't good for you. Sometimes the soul is at war with itself, and so it hides in the midst of the conflict. But David tells us in verse number one that the soul that thirsts for God seeks God. The soul, the soul can be a mess, a mess. Man, you ever looked in the mirror and just say, I'm a mess? Y'all won't even look at me when I say it. Just, I just, all right, I'll say it by myself. I, I looked at myself in the mirror and said, God, I'm a mess. This is a, this a mess. What are we going to do about this? The soul can be a mess of mean appetites and thirst that, that, that rule us even to the point of our pain and destruction. The soul can be a mess of appetites because, because we don't know what our thirst means. We don't know what our thirst means and because we don't understand that, that underneath our thirst, are y'all still with me? You still hanging with me? We don't understand that underneath our thirst is the thirst for God. 
that, that the soul, the soul which, which, which was breathed into us by, by God, the soul is crying out for God through brokenness and emptiness and even our fears and our anger. The soul is crying out. The soul is crying out for God underneath our addictions and our pain and our hurt and our worry. The soul is crying out for God and, 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 and etching out through easing and oozing out through all of those things that, that we feel and we war and we fight with. The soul is saying, I'm thirsty for God because we don't know what that means. We turn to other stuff. We turn to other stuff to pacify temporarily, to shut up the cry of the soul. It is like watching the, the lights on your dashboard flash red and yellow and flash and scream at you and think that the answer is to turn off the lights. And so when our soul is screaming at us, we self-medicate and we silence the noise so we don't have to hear it. But the soul is crying out for God. The soul which came from God bends towards God and is crying out for God. But because we don't understand that, we we turn to things that don't satisfy. Isaiah uh, said, why, 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 why do you spend money for that which is not bread? And your labor for that which does not satisfy. Come. He who thirsts, come. Come to the waters, and he who has no money, come. There, there is this, this deep Thirst in every soul that cannot be satisfied by any other thing but the living water of God. And so David says, the soul that thirsts, the soul that knows its thirst, the soul that touches its thirst, comes out of hiding and seeks God. And so he says, come out of hiding. Expose your, your broken, thirsty soul to the God that it longs for. Because as long as you pursue poisonous waters and dried up fountains, you'll keep drinking poison and sucking air. And your soul will never be satisfied. Because the reality is, the reality is that you just have to keep getting more and more sucking air. but it will never satisfy. David, David says that the one, the one who gets honest, the one who gets honest about its soul's thirst will seek God. You cannot have it both ways, he says. You cannot hide your soul from God and seek God at the same time because nobody can find God who does not first find their own soul. It is a soul that seeks for God, that thirsts for God. And as long as you keep pursuing Coca-Cola, you will never be satisfied with water. As long as you keep being satisfied on McDonald's, you will never know what real food is. As long as Pookie is your pursuit, And Shanene is your addiction, you will never pursue God. But the soul who knows its thirst, who owns its thirst, will seek after God. That's not the only bread coming. Look at verse number five. Verse number five, he gives us the second bread crumb. He says, not only does the soul that thirsts seek for God, but look at verse number five. This may be encouragement to you. 
Maybe you're thinking that, oh, oh, I, I got a messed up back. My soul about as jacked up as that preacher up there talking. My soul is in trouble. Here is verse number five. What encouragement. The soul, verse five, that seeks God will be satisfied. Will be. Verse number five, my soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness. My mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. This is a, the Passion Translation. I overflow with praise when I come before you. For the anointing of your presence satisfies me like nothing else. You are such a rich banquet of pleasure for my soul. Are you seeking pleasure? Are you seeking pleasure? David says that God is a rich banquet of pleasure for the soul. God is not like drugs. You're a drug, drugs, you, you, start out, you start out small. Don't, don't look at me like you know what I'm talking about. You start out with a little nickel bag or, or something. But after a while, that ain't enough. Because the nickel bag that got you high a month ago won't get you high right now. And after a while, you find that, that you got to add stuff to it and you got to move on to something else and graduate to more and more and more just to get the first high you had. But David says that God satisfies the soul. He doesn't entice it with false pleasure. He satisfies the soul. Satisfy is to be filled to satisfaction, to have enough, to be filled to the full, to have plenty. Here in verse number five, the psalmist describes the hungry soul satisfied by God, verse number five, as erupting with praise. You ever, you ever, you ever, you ever ate something so good? That long after it was gone, you licked your lips. You, you, ever, you ever ate something so good that, that the napkin wasn't worthy of it? And you just licked up every crumb? I gave my I gave my I gave my four year old grandson a little cup of little cup of ice cream the other day little cup of ice cream and I and I and I was trying not to give him too much and so every every now and then don't tell Sylvia every now and then as I I I give him some I take a little that I wasn't supposed to have because I didn't want him to eat that much but he he was finishing up the cup and now and now the little bitty cup the little bitty cup of vanilla ice cream was was empty and the only thing that remaining was some melted residue around around the edge and I was ready to throw it out he said no 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 pop pop no pop pop and so he took the little a bitty cup and he smashed it to his face and he took his little tongue and worked it around the edges David says that the soul is satisfied with God so much that it licks its lips that's why, that's why David says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. No, notice, notice that it is not just, it is not just that the psalmist finds satisfaction in God, but that the hungry soul is satisfied by God. It's not that, that satisfaction is in God, but he is satisfied by God. Satisfied, not, not by some created thing, but by God himself. 
For the soul that seeks God is satisfied by nothing else but God. <laughs> this, 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 this phrase gives, gives us both a caution and a promise. Caution is to beware lest our unrenewed mind and our worldly appetites convince us that God does not satisfy. Lest our worldly minds and unrenewed, uh, our worldly appetites and unrenewed minds convince us that God is not enough for the soul. This verse tells us, be warned, that if the soul is not being satisfied by God, we have not been eating. We have not been eating. I, I can't call no names because I don't want to get into trouble, but there's some folk around here that, that, that cook. I mean, really cook. I mean, like, really, really cook. Where you, like, eat till you hurt yourself. Kind of cook. He says, listen, if, if you are not being satisfied by God, if the soul is not being satisfied by God, don't, don't laugh because there's something that, that can't cook. But um, he says, listen, if the soul is not being satisfied by God, it is because the soul is not eating, not because God is lacking. Perhaps we have only nibbled because our soul's taste have been more trained to sin and junk food. It is the soul that passes up a succulent pot roast for a White Castle soy burger. Yes, it is. But how often are we pursuing satisfaction in worldly things that fill up our day and fill up our time until we have no space and no room for the God who would satisfy the soul? How often do we not have time for God? That we choose a drive through burger over a sit-down meal because we are too busy and too big of a hurry and we filled our life with so much stuff that we've convinced ourselves that God does not satisfy. But the soul that hungers and thirsts, the soul that comes and eats will be satisfied. This is the promise of God to every hungry and thirsty, seeking soul. Psalm 107 verse 9 says that he satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry soul with goodness. Are you finding that to be true? Are you, are you, are you feasting on him? Jesus promised, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Again, Isaiah 55, different translation says, why do you spend money on junk food? You earn cash on cotton candy? Listen to me, listen well. Eat only the best. Fill yourself with only the finest. Pay attention, come close now. Listen carefully to my life-giving, life-nourishing words. The soul that seeks God will be satisfied. Will. This is the promise. None, none who seek him, none who trust him are ever disappointed. 
The only folk disappointed are those who have not sought him, who have not feasted on him and had their souls satisfied by him. We have spent so much effort in American Christianity to dilute the taste of Jesus. To sap all of the fat. <laughs> to sap all of the life out of him so that he might be more palatable to people who don't want him anyway. And then we are surprised that he is no longer attractive to us either. There is category of food, which I won't mention because I, I don't want to get in any kind of trouble. And I have tried it. I have tried it. I have tried to eat the food. I have tried to eat the chicken that is void of fat. <laughs> I've tried to eat the pot roast with all the fat and grease sucked out. I know you look at me and say, he's such an unhealthy pastor. <laughs> And I do. We do really watch our diets. We are really working harder at watching our diets. You may not be able to tell yet, but I am. But the reality, the reality is that food is, is not just about sustenance. It is about taste. And it is about pleasure. Otherwise, simply give me a pill with everything in it. But the reason we sit down and eat the reason we lick our lips and smack our lips, the reason that anticipation makes us wait is because it tastes. And the reason, the reason we come to God, the reason we seek him, the reason we pursue him, the reason that we want his, his, his felt presence is not just because it's the right thing to do, but because God created us not simply to know that he was, but to enjoy him forever. You want to know the reason for life? You want to know the, the reason for our existence? It is to know and enjoy God forever. So the psalmist says, the soul that seeks God will be satisfied. Finally, verse number eight, verse number eight, look at verse number eight. The soul that is satisfied by God returns to God. Do you see it? KJV says that my soul followeth hard after thee, my, my soul, ESV, clings to you. The passion, the passion translation, with, with passion I pursue and cling to you because I feel your grip on my life. I keep my soul close to your heart. Verse number eight describes the thirsty and hungry soul having been satisfied by God returns to God again and again and again. You know why we keep going back to our favorite restaurant? Because it was good. <laughs> so somebody, somebody, so somebody was, was, was ranting and raving out on the, the Facebook one day, ranting and raving about the uh, uh, religion, Christianity being uh, experience uh, ver versus doctrine. That 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 there's a that, that the Pentecostals and and all these other crazy folk are all wrapped up in in experience. And I and I thought to myself, hey, 
Hey, Christianity without experience is, is like going to Ruth Chris and being satisfied with reading the menu. Christianity without the experience of the presence of God, without being satisfied by God, is like being satisfied to read the menu. I didn't come to read the menu. And when I, when I go to Ruth Chris, I don't read the menu. I know what I want. I'm not and my soul has been eating it all day long. I know what I want. I want a 20 ounce, juicy, medium, well, ribeye with the bone in. I want a little charcoal on the corner. I know what I want. Don't, don't come. I don't come to the menu. I don't come to the menu, just, just the menu alone. I come because I, I savor what I'm eating. Because as I'm reading, I'm licking my, my lips. And I, as I'm looking at the menu, I'm thinking. And no matter where else we go, no matter where else we go, we are always comparing with where we got satisfied at. The psalmist said that, that the soul that is satisfied by God returns to God again and again and again and again. Even in the wilderness, even under siege, the soul remembers how it got satisfied with God. Let, let this be an encouragement to the backslide. Not, not to be in condemnation, but to be enticed by this invitation. Let this be an invitation to those who have strayed, not to be beaten down because you have strayed away, but to hear this as an invitation to come out of White Castle and McDonald's and find pleasure, real pleasure in the meat of God. Verse 8 says that the soul remembers See, verse 8, verse 8 said, the soul remembers the soul. The soul remembers when the mind forgets the soul. The soul remembers even when we strayed away. It is the soul that remembers and brings us back again. It is not, it is not the mind. It is not the mind that triggers. It is the soul that remembers. Remember that young boy left his father, you remember? Left his father. Said, give me, give me the money I got coming to me. Give me the money I got coming to me, old man. And he left and went to a far country. And there in the far country, he spent all his money, wasted it on riotous living. But then the text said after all his stuff was gone, after all his money and his friends was gone, his soul, he said he came to himself. That ain't got nothing to do with the mind. That's about the soul. The soul remembered how it was back home. The soul remembered what he had with daddy. The soul remembered what he walked away from. So the soul told his mind, get up, boy. And get on back home. Psalm 42 and verse 4 says that the soul the soul remembers, the soul remembers David's, David's, David is thirsting for God like a deer panting after the water brooks. And in verse number eight, verse number four of Psalm 42, he says, I remember how it used to be. I remember how we used to go to church. I remember how we used to go up singing and, and worshiping and praising God in the temple. He says, I remember how it used to be and I want it back. If you're a backslider out there, if you're wayward and you walked away from God, you strayed away from God, just open your mouth and tell him I want it back. 
Come on, I want it back. I miss you, and I want it. I want it back. The soul that has ever been satisfied by God returns to God again and again and again. It returns to the one who satisfied. The soul satisfied by God wants more of him. Soul once satisfied by God is not content with having been satisfied before, but presses in for more. This, this is verse 8. To follow hard, to cling to him. To adhere, to stick to him. To catch him by the pursuit. Cleave. To follow close, to be joined together, to pursue hard after him. David says, my soul follows hard after you. Because I've tasted something. Tasted something that nothing else can satisfy. Tasted of you. Nothing else can satisfy. My 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 backyard. And the brushy waters behind it. For all the years that we've been there has been a gathering place for wild animals. Most times I talk about it and people just don't believe that in our city that there's such wild animals. I've sat on my deck in the early mornings and watched the sun rise. And I've watched the raccoons and the possums come home in the wee hours of the morning like teenagers out too late. They've been up all night and now they will sleep all day. <laughs> Nepish wild animals. In the early morning rises, early morning hours as the sun rises, I watch them from, from my deck and if I'm if I'm absolutely still and quiet, I think in the presence of the Lord only I discover that some of them will come close to me. I, I've been I've been awakened sometimes as I've dozed off in the presence of the Lord. Been awakened to the sound of screaming birds in the trees warning me that a skunk was coming up. A few years ago, a few years ago, I purchased a pot of uh, tulips. I started planting flowers all around the house and changed everything out, bushes and houses all, all around, all around the house. And so I, I, I saw this, this pot of, Gorgeous tulips at, at the Home Depot. And so I, I bought it. But I could never really figure out where to put it because I had so much stuff around. I didn't know where the tulips fit. And so I set it on my on my deck while I decided. And, and, and that's where it sat. Even as the seasons change, that's where it sat. Then the hungry squirrels found the bulbs. They'd look up, eyes darting on the side of their heads, watching me. They, they watched me watch them. <laughs> watch them watching me watch them. But the reward outweighed the risk for them. And one day as I was sitting still, and quiet, they worked up the nerve, 
come up on my deck and steal the bulbs out of my pot. After a while, they, they realized that, that I was safe. And was satisfied, they just kept coming back until two dozen bulbs of tulips had been eaten. You, you say, well, Pastor, why didn't you just move the pot? Because after the third or fourth bulb, I just, I wanted to see how they would come back. And so I would stand at the window, at the, at the window of the, 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 the door there, and I would peek out the blinds, and I would watch them come up on the deck and dig in my planter and take my tulips. And sometimes they would eat them there. Sometimes they would grab it and scurry along. Sometimes they, as they were digging, they'd look up and see me standing there and go back to eating them. And we'd watch each other watch each other. They decided that the reward outweighed the risk. And so having been once satisfied, they just kept coming back. Here's the, really the question of this text today is, are you willing to risk exposing your soul to God to get what he has for you. Does the reward, does the reward outweigh the risk? Does, are you willing to risk exposing your soul to a God who loves you completely and unconditionally? I get if you don't want to tell me your secrets. But what about him? Are you willing to take that risk? And to say, God, I'm thirsty. I'm thirsty. I'm, 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 I'm hungry and, and, and nothing is satisfying me. I'm chasing everything and I've done this for so long and I'm tired and I'm weary of chasing other things and I'm thirsty and I'm hungry. I, I tell you that the risk of exposure is outweighed by the reward of being refreshed. And so look deep. Look deep inside. Look deep inside and be honest. Is your soul thirsty? Is it hungry? Is it hungry? Is it thirsty? Beneath all the surface stuff, all the hiding, are you missing God? Are you missing God? It could be that you're, you're missing something that you never really knew you could have, but you can. So knows. Maybe you've wandered away from God. Good news of this text is that you can come back. You can come back. The, the soul knows the way back. <laughs> Maybe you've just grown cold and distant and need refreshing. Here's what Jesus says, and I'm and I'm done, but we'll go pray together. Here's what Jesus says in, in, in John 7. And 37, he says, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. John adds that Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit who is given to everyone who believes. And so right now, in this moment, would you just slip up your hands right where you are? Just, just slip, slip up your, your hand. Just slip up your hand. It is present. Just slip your hand. 
here's 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 some here's some really good news that may even seem unfair to you. But regardless of the level of your thirst, regardless of how far you've drifted away or not at all, the water's the same. It's Jesus. The living water is the same. He satisfies. Joy he supplies. Life would be worthless without him. All that we need is in Jesus.